So here he is. We finally tracked him down. One of the original Brim Pro Series, AFC Series 1 angler and the man who's synonymous with uh, rod building in Australia, uh, Ian Barramilla. How are you, buddy? It's uh, you're, you're, in, you're in a bit of a, a, a tragic part of the world, mate. You had the bushfires. Now you've got COVID. You know, you're just waiting for the third, for the big three, aren't you? Yeah, at least I had a good business plan. Not that it's doing me that much good at the moment, but uh, no, we'll be right. We'll be right. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna chill and have a beer with you while we answer some questions or whatever and have a chat and enjoy the Friday well, night. Well, you know, we, we, I suppose we're like you. You know, there was no business plan that ABT could have where we could have predicted where it's like, you know what? At, in in March, you probably can't run another event for six months. How are you going to deal with that? And it's like, oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's a curly one. But uh, this lockdown yeah. live show is one of the things that we've done and that's been, been really popular, of course. And one of the most popular segments is talking to these original uh, AFC anglers. In season one, it was called the Brim Pro Series and you were one of um, five anglers, I think, that, uh, that did a Brim tour um, all the way from Brisbane to Melbourne, mate. And it was... Uh, they were good road trips, you know, including um, overheating bearings and uh, late nights on the beers and fish and cameras. Oh, is, and yeah. Yeah. It was oh, stuff going everywhere, all. mate. You yeah, did two yeah, seasons. I, I, I did. Yeah, I did. We, I did the first two. I had, uh, unfortunately, work commitments um, stopped me from fishing three and four, which I also qualified for. But, uh, yeah, we certainly made a big shakedown cruise over the, out of those two. There wasn't much we didn't have to deal with from memory. I, I remember on the second one, which we're not, maybe not talking about tonight, but when I was uh, paired up with Carl, um, his car caught on fire on the way home because of a, the dodgy trailer that someone else had palmed off onto a seat. It was just like one thing after another. Anyway, that's... No, it's all good, mate. That, that's, we're, that, that's all part of the times on the road. I remember think, pulling up behind you when, when something was, there was smoke coming out of your gear and that was just standard. You know, we, we've talked to Adam Reuter already about him ditching his camera band on the Gold Coast. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we, we basically broke everything that could be broken over those years, didn't we? We did. And um, the thing I learned is, is that we were making TV, we weren't fishing a tournament. And uh, most of the time we weren't fishing at all. So once I came to terms with that, um, I was okay and actually did all right. But, but yeah, the first the first few events, um, how many did we do in that first series? Four? I think about five. Five? Yeah. I remember I, I started off terrible and but we were still um, trying to fix stuff on the boats, which had been thrown together the day before um, on the Brisbane River. It was I was still like trying to get my electric to function properly because of the way it was mounted like the after, late in the afternoon, failing light with a 6 a.m. start in the morning. It was like, okay, I think I'm, I'm going to be ready to fish if I can actually, you know, make my rig go properly. <laughs> yeah. No, no, look, they were great times and a great, a great set of anglers too. Like, you know, the, the original team that fished that, like the guys from the South Coast, you know, yourself, Ridey, Starlo, you know, and even Bushy, you, you appeared at a lot of ABT events in the early days. And I think that's, um, you, you know, your Miller Rods brand was, it was the one, in the first four or five years of ABT, you needed the Miller Rods Brim Buster, didn't you? That was a big marketplace for you. Yeah, it was. It was huge. It opened up a, a really big market for me in, um, in that genre of rod. And the cool thing about it was I was sort of designing on the run. So I could always introduce a new model or, or um, just really figure out exactly what was required in any particular um, type of lure application just from our own involvement in the ABT Brim series. And I remember um, one one time one of my mates said to me, you know, I, I went down to the weigh-in and I walked along the foreshore where all the boats were pulled up and, like, all the guys that were doing good had you had at least one Brim buster on board. Some of them had heaps. And I thought, yeah, well, that's pretty cool. I never thought about it that way. But, um, of course, there were different times then. There wasn't the same amount of product available off the, off the rack as there is uh, or as there was even 10 years later, let alone now. And um, I, I was just able to deliver a really good product at the time when it was needed. And it's still, you know, it hold, they hold their own. Some Most of those models... Um, are, are still currently in use and yes. um, although I've managed to sort of get into the much more finer points of um, of lure 
application and, and make uh, Primrod models more more application specific. Um, you know, rods like the Brawler, which uh, which we we would all uh, Starlo, Righty, and I especially were using in the um, in that early AFC stuff uh, on the Hawkesbury River, and um, th that's still a current model. That's still my most popular brim buster because it, it it just does such a good job of fishing a light lure with finesse to structure, and then being able to haul kilo brim out if you need to, and it's a hard animal to make, you know. So it was cool that I came up with it at the time, and it's even better that it's stood the test of time. Well, the physics doesn't change, does it? Like the fish does a certain thing, the rod does another thing, and it, if it's now or 10 years ago or in 20 years' time, nothing much is really going to change in that battle, is it? No, it's not. And, you know, the, the only difference in the brawler is the cosmetic. And uh, <clears throat> and the guide, the guide train is obviously a lot higher tech now than it was then. But essentially the action and, you know, the blank, what, everything about the blank is pretty much the same. I, I kind of got that sus because one of the first things we did back then, of course, was fished oyster racks. And, we, you know, session after session we'd be going, so how are we actually going to get these things out of those racks? You know, so yeah. we, uh, you, you can hook them, but getting them out was another story. But And uh, there was more than more than one co-angler that both Slick and I had, especially on the Hawkesbury, when we, we dumped a kilo or a kilo and a half brim in the boat, just threw it in, yeah. that they had to pick their jaw up off the deck. You know, it, yeah. it, it was pretty full-on fishing back then. Unfortunately, it's not quite as as hectic as it, as it used to be for a number of reasons, but the brawler still has a real place. And, you know, even as recently as some of the comps earlier this year, you know, being used down at Gippsland Lakes in the straits, still a go-to rod for pulling big, big black cream out of those barnacle encrusted, you know, natural banks. So it, it's got, it's really, you know, got a place. Mate, the, uh, one of the AFC episodes, I remember you doing some really cool, close structure stuff was the event you won on Sydney Harbour, which uh, which I remember, you know, you, you were a bit of a, a fu I think you were on, on the rowing docks, like, and you had places yeah. where you, that lure was going out of sight, but the brim was coming out, and that's that's the difference between winning and losing in AFC. You have such a small amount of time to do it. You've got to have things go your way, then you win. If they don't, someone else wins. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, everyone's got to understand with AFC, it's not, not just going fishing it for starters it's not just fishing a, a tournament secondly it's filming a tv show so you know you, you're not there's a whole lot of pressures that you don't really consider until you're actually doing it and um if you don't have the right tackle then it, it's pretty difficult to get a good result that's for sure and you know back then we were learning about so much stuff that um you know, even during the AFC, we learned a lot about Sydney Harbour. You know, some of us hadn't really fished there before, so you know, it was um, it was pretty cool to be able to. Um, when it, it, you know, last time I watched it, I thought, yeah, we're actually we're, we're learning stuff there, and there's some brim history unfolding as this as this comp is is being filmed, and you know, it's great that it's documented. Yeah, it is. And we've got a lot of that ABT footage from the early days. We're starting to roll up there now. Some of the early days in Foster, you know, looking at that reef science tank full of gigantic blue nose brim that possibly hadn't seen many lures before. It was the real wild right. west of, of, of brim. Right. Um, yeah, apart from uh, apart from your yours and Carl's car catching fire, uh, yeah. any other memories stick out from a, from uh, the old AFC days? Oh, um. Yeah, there's plenty, mate. I mean, th th those, as you said, they were they were big road trips. They were, um, you know, stacked with with one experience and, and memorable moment after another. But um, yeah, winning this winning the Sydney Harbour round was obviously right up there because you got to remember you're fishing against the calibre of some pretty damn hot fishermen in uh, in Slick and with Timmy and. Um, Apart from the memory of, of Slick continually beating me when I had a good day just by pulling an amazing day, like his best day ever out, which he's, he's done to me in the ABT as well as in the AFC. Um, yeah, it would be the Sydney Harbour win for sure. 
he did it to all of us in the early days. And, uh, and look, I've, I've always said that there was a, a cohort of writers that, that put their balls on the line. You know, yourself, Starlo, Bushy, the guys that turned up and risked the reputation in a tournament. A lot of journalists ran, and I really give you guys kudos for accepting that challenge and not running away from it. Well, thanks. Uh, and I appreciate that, and I understand it, and I, I've used that analogy. Uh, well, not maybe not the balls on the line analogy, but I've suggested to uh, many people in our industry since then that if you if you really want to like, test yourself and if you really want to um, sort of get yourself in, in the the mindset of everybody that you reckon you're better of, better than, go and fish a comp. And, you know, it's um it's not until you actually put yourself out there, put your balls on the line, as you said, that you will really find out how how good you are. And that's uh, it it's just an undeniable truth of yep. going and fishing a comp. I think the uh, I think the modern day equivalent of that are the social media champs now, you know, they've got big followings, but they get to curate all of their fishing and their footage, and they can they only show you the good things. Like you know, there's there's nothing as raw as as being put to the test and you know being watched do it. You know, we put cameras in boats nowadays at ABT. There's no secrets. Um, if you have an awesome capture, it's recorded, and if you have a rubbish day, it's also recorded. So you know, we've always been pretty raw at ABT and unapologetic because we have a level playing field, and the one that wins it is the one who's obviously fished the best and had the best luck. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, things things can and can't go your way, but that's the same for everybody. And and um, I, I, what I love about um, your current ABT filming is is the immediate um, washdown of knowledge that's coming from all the guys that you got a camera on the boat. So yeah. you, you can see how you fish or, or how Chris Hickson fish or you know whoever, and not only see the difference in uh, your your tournament approach in terms of techniques, but even the difference in how you execute very similar techniques at times. Yeah. And it's a really good insight into um, seeing how a, a good um, angler works. And, and, you know, we always said the best way to learn was to be a, a co-angler and, you know, you get a draw, sooner or later you're going to get drawn with really good guys. Well, what you're providing now is that almost that experience to uh, anybody that cares to tune in. It's, you know, really valuable. That's it. And what I think it does is it also gives other boaters that experience because I normally wouldn't get an opportunity to see how how um, how Chris Hickson fishes. But when I'm cutting his yeah. highlights up, I get to see some of those uh, those uh, idiosyncrasies and I get to share them with everyone. And, of course, our, our motto is who shares wins, so uh, we, we love sharing it. I really appreciate that virtually every angler asked to run a camera says, yep, no worries. Like in the a couple of years ago, some of them were a bit dodgy and they, you know, we had a few incidents where they forgot to turn it on and stuff like that. But that basically doesn't happen nowadays. Everyone appreciates the fact if they do well in the highlights, it helps their sponsors and it helps their profile yep. and it's, you know, it's good for them. So, and it's good for the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great opportunity. You should always grab those opportunities. And that's how I see competing in, in ABT. It's an opportunity. You know, it's... Um, you just can't get that sort of experience anywhere else. That's the bottom line. Now, mate, you've been a uh, a sponsor of ABT uh, on and off sometimes, but for nearly twenty years now. And if it's not the ABT, it's the anglers fishing in the ABT. You've yeah. got yourself to a position now where we talked about fifteen, twenty years ago, where someone else is doing lots of the rolling that's not you. You know, so these production range you've got rods you've got now, it's sort of getting back to the old days where you look at a lot of boats and there are a lot of guys have those available for the right price, Miller Rods, production rods that are getting the job done. It must must make you feel good must make you feel good to to see the whole thing turn the whole wheel around, mate. It's uh, using your experience and getting them uh, OEM built for you and uh, and being the designer and not the not the worker is the way to go, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, it was always the plan, mate, to be honest. Um, you know, for twenty years I was um, basically the chief rod designer for Shimano. And uh, I, I continued with Miller Rods, the brand and the label, um, through all that, because A, because it, it gave me a real um, a real way of developing continual development. You know, there's nothing quite like custom building rods to make sure you're staying on the cutting edge of what can be done with fishing rod design. Yeah. Uh, it gave me opportunity to fish, um, which is absolutely, you know, 
fundamental part of understanding how the rod works. And uh, it also, it kept my brand there because I knew, you know, one day that the time would come when um, I'd no longer be doing that job with Shimano. And I, I, I really, really love it. I love that. I love designing rods. So, yeah, it, it was um, it was great that I did that because I was able to basically just um, step into the into the the production design uh, role for uh, my own brand, which is yeah. really cool. And uh, let's face it, I'm not getting any any younger. I can't be hunched over a binding bench for the, you know for my whole life. Yeah. Um, and it, the the biggest issues for me as a custom builder were um, making enough, it, you know, even at a premium price, I, I could never make enough. So, uh, the, being able to produce really high end rods as a production rod allows me to supply the market at a good price. And, um, you know, all those people that, well, plenty of people that wanted them, um, but couldn't get it for one reason or another, they, I guess they've got them now. It's good to hear, it's good to, to know that you're seeing them in, in the boats. Yeah, and look, mate, just uh, thanks for joining us tonight and telling us through those stories. But give us a bit of a shout-out to to your website and your socials where people can go to get their Friday afternoon rod candy that you're famous for. Um, yep, you can uh, follow me on Instagram, just uh, just Miller Rods. There's a couple of Miller Rods pages. Um, we run one for the USA, which is – that's pretty cool too. Don't be afraid to follow that one. Yep. And we have a, also have a new one in uh, Sweden. Uh, Miller Rods SC, also pretty cool to watch what's going on there. But um, just plain Miller Rods is the one to follow uh, the brand on Instagram. Also Miller Rods Facebook page. I'm personally on those socials, but um, if you're more interested in in the rods themselves, yeah, that's where you'll you'll sort of see what's going on. That's awesome, mate. Uh, mate, thanks for joining us tonight, sharing a beer on a Friday night at Lockdown Live, and uh, let's hope you get to. Uh, Let's get you hope to wet a line again soon. Don't work until dark every day, mate. You got to go and got to go and fish them. I'll try not to. I can't believe um, we got through this without you asking me about Miller Rod's rage back in the AFC days. <laughs> you know. Well, I, let, let's let's go there then. You know, I I, I don't know if, uh, if a couple of beers down in Miller might uh, inflict a bit of rod range on me, but let's face oh, it, you were hundreds. famous for it back oh. then. Um, well, you know, the funny thing was. Um, editing is a powerful tool in in television. Yep. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely uh, I'm guilty of rod rage, but I reckon the only one that never I never saw um, act any rod rage was maybe Starlo. Um, I'm, because I, I watched the other guys do it and and watch the episodes as they came out and think, how come I'm the only one that gets pinged for this uh, Miller rod rage? But then I realise it it kind of it fitted the, the name and the brand. So my advice is if you're going to um, show any any rod rage, especially Miller rod rage, do not harm the fishing rod. You can't harm the fishing rod. There's a, <laughs> there's a, real, there's a real technique involved in it. Generally, it involves um, a line just wafting in the air with nothing on the end of it, and that's why you're, you're going into a rage in the first place. But you don't want to have a lure. You really don't want to have a lure tied on your rod if you're going to get involved in rod rage. What you need is uh, just an unencumbered rod with no lure weight on the end and you need to whip it really fast and maybe just graze the surface of the water with it for a little bit of effect. Don't hit the boat, don't slam it into anything else, just really like let it out with a, with a good old fashioned grunt and your miller rod rage is done. That's awesome, mate. That, and that's, you know, a real real trap for young players. If that rod hits anything, you might as well just throw it because it's going to be busted, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Warranty's gone. And that's I'll be asking. Thing. Well, there you go. <laughs> mate, thanks for joining us again tonight. And, and look, the rod, the rod rage was famous. Mm -hmm. If someone else was doing the edit, you've got no control over it. So, no. mate, just let it fly. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Awesome, mate. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, mate, on ABT Lockdown Live. Okay. No worries. Anytime.